When World War II broke out, my father buried his typewriter in the back garden of his house and got it back safely when the war was over. All the tweets you're about to see are typed on that typewriter. So from 1954 to 62, he was Philippine ambassador to London, and he discovered the job of a Philippine ambassador is somewhat different to the job of an ambassador from a larger, better-known country. And um, he felt, at times, like an elaborate fraud, like his country didn't exist. There was so little information. So he wrote that our problem is not so much bad publicity, but no publicity at all. And this is a situation I think we still find ourselves in today. And when, when we looked at um, the tourism campaign, we had that discovery. To help overcome the general ignorance about the country, he wrote books. He brought um, Philippine culture to London. He held many cocktail parties. And it must be said that it is the books, including the biography he wrote of Rizal, that we are still talking about today. A book is always better than a cocktail party. One of the great aphorisms about this country is coined by another relative, and that is that the Philippines spent 300 years in a convent and 50 years in Hollywood. And for this, we can conclude, as my father did, that no one country can provide a perfect model or example for any other. Not Spain, not the US. It's us who define what our nation is. So the national hero, Jose Rizal, had a collaborator called Blumentritt, and the letters between them have become the foundation of a lot of uh, biographical work. And he wrote that if the Philippines had not become Spanish at the time that it did, we would all have been um, probably conquered by uh, Islam coming from the south. Whether this would have been better or worse, he said, he did not know. But if the Spanish had reached the Philippines only 50 years later, Filipinos would now all be Muslim, which is an interesting thought. I think it's just interesting to note just how long it takes to type things on a manual typewriter. <laughs> Unlike a computer, this is how it is. And if you make a mistake, you have to go back and do it all over again. Um, so moving on to, to that Spanish rule. The generals sent to the, were sent to the Philippines for a span of about four years. And they had to depend on the advice and assistance of the Spanish friars at that time. They were the only element of continuity. Governments might rise and fall in Madrid. Governors might come and go in Manila. But the friars remained. Of about 2,000 towns in the Philippines at that time, it was estimated that to maintain Spanish authority would need maybe 20 soldiers in each town. And that would have meant essentially um, 40,000 men. That would have cost Spain an amount of 25 million crowns a year. I don't know the exchange rate, but that sounds like quite a lot of money in those days. And that was what friars saved the Spanish state. So we were essentially um, conquered, and the Spanish colonization was maintained by the friars. And that was what, um, that was what they saved by doing so, which is interesting. And again, it takes quite a long time to write. And the implications of that, as you... As you I think we're still living with the implications of that in, in many ways. You're allowed to switch on your phones, by the way, and you can follow all these tweets on uh, wefilipinos.com... Oh, sorry, wefilipinos on Twitter. So, one of the great legacies of the American regime came afterwards, was the concept of equality. And our people probably, he wrote, did not have any practical experience with the idea of equality. But the US 
introduced that notion and changed our system. Um, we, had, we didn't have the, any, any elaborate caste system, but we did have this idea of the landowner and the, the person who worked on the land, and the two were very different and did not, um, did not speak to each other, did not see each other as equal. So at the time we were, the revolution was held against Spain, we were very clear about asserting that a Filipino was good as a Spaniard, but we never did get to adding that one Filipino was as good as another Filipino. And that was what came out of the American occupation. So Rizal was a national hero and was a, a modern man in a medieval community. He was a nonconformist in a society where church and state were united and where consequently religious skepticism was unpatriotic and political dissent irreligious. Or looked at another way, where the free thinker was a standard bearer of the freedom of thought. And his um, Rizal became the national hero by, by writing two novels. He wrote uh, The Noli Me Tangere and El Filibusterismo, and they, despite being only printed in quantities of about a thousand each, were distributed, found their way to the Philippines, and um, led to the revolution against, against Spain. Despite being dis printed and distributed in such small quantities, Aguinaldo was the president of our first republic, a ruthless and able leader of armies whose brilliant guerrilla tactics had compelled the Americans to mobilize against him more than five times the number of men they mobilized against the Spanish. The tragedy is that he did not die in battle. He lived on in a changing world which he did not understand, which no longer needed him. Therefore, most heroes are born only when they die. And so it was for Emilio Aguinaldo. Rizal wrote that the lack of a national consciousness gives rise to another evil, which is the absence of all opposition to measures prejudicial to the people and the absence of any initiative to whatever may rebound to their good. And throughout the centuries, under Spanish rule, one tribe was set against another. Visayans would fight Tagalogs, Tagalogs, Bicolanos, Pampangos, Ilocanos. Outsiders would simply see us all as Indios. And in dying, he gave the Filipinos a consciousness of being of one nation. Rizal taught Filipinos they could be something else. Before him, they were just individuals, not a member of a nation. So when the revolution did come on June 12, 1898, a thin, gray, paralyzed philosopher was seen, was carried into the town of Kawit from the, from the bay in a hammock. This was Mabini, the political genius who brought the revolution together, who, who, who directed the policy of the First Republic. When elected president of the Supreme Court, some objected, and he said, is the president of the Supreme Court a messenger who needs to walk around and deliver things all day? Or is he someone who, as long as his head and his hands are ready for the work, can, can do the work? So he did something much more difficult than die for his country. He lived for it. My father was brought into the negotiations for the dispute over the Sabah region in 1968. This was a dispute against the Malaysians. And he wrote this, referring to that claim. 
what other nation would rely on purely legal arguments to pursue a territorial claim involving determined and well-armed neighbors. We may have the best lawyers in the world, but a brief is not a battleship. And he felt that we could be very naive when dealing with other nations. He felt that we, we could, um, could not really... Um, we believed that everything would play out fairly. Whereas as individuals, we all know that um, we're very good at playing the system, uh, being very realistic about what we can achieve. But as a nation, we're very naive. So as individuals, we Filipinos know every trick of the game. What makes us so naive in dealing with other nations? Okay. In our political system, what is wrong is not changing parties, but to change to the wrong party. And the wrong party is the one that is out or is about to be out of power. It's often observed that we don't have political parties here. We have allegiances to individuals. People vote for personalities, not for policies. And the system, unusual and pointless, and even reprehensible as it may seem, um, has, has some advantages. It needs to be understood. Okay. <clears throat> At the time he wrote this, for centuries we Filipinos have been last in our own country, now we mean to be the first. This was connected to the policy of Asia for the Asians, Filipino first. He wrote this and then basically had to leave his job as Under Secretary of Foreign Affairs because um, he was seen as being um, too, too independent in his policy making. I'm sorry, that was a sequence. So, this, so this, is the, this is the tweet about the political parties. Um, so I'm, I'm also in, in the process of researching all this stuff, and I'm, I'm learning it as I go along. I think, I hope by seeing it, you get a sense of why it might be important to learn about history. Uh, if you are Filipino, you're part Filipino, you're living in the Philippines, how you can learn <coughs> that the situations we see now, that we read about now in the papers, are not new. A lot of the, the, the things that we criticize, a lot of the situations with politicians being, um, not being aligned to an idea, of, of being um, seemingly coming together for the sole purpose of... Um, getting their hands on the spoils. This is, this is what has been happening for years. And even back in reading these now, you can see that they resonate over time. Okay. So at the commencement speech of the at the Ateneo in 1977, my father addressed a class that 100 years ago had previously produced the national hero, Jose Rizal, and wondered what had led him out of all the graduates to greatness. I think there were 12 in his class, and what was it that made one of them unusual? What was it that made one of them stand out and decide to be, or what, what led him to greatness? And he wrote that we must seek it in the fact that he alone was moved by the spirit of his times. But we must also recognize that each age is different and that what pulls us together, um, what, what makes us do one person do one thing in one age is not what's going to happen in this age. So to compare historical periods and draw parallels is an exercise in deception. So we know, as Filipinos, discouragingly little about our national heroes. Aguinaldo, the first president, liked Bonifacio, but unlike Rizal and the Illustrados, the, the rich mestizos, was gagged and muzzled by his humble birth. He left no diaries, letters, novels, or memoirs, 
just a handful of statements to a biographer. And so it is, the poor leave behind no annals for the biographer to research. A lot of our heroes didn't leave um, much behind. However, he, um, he did spend a decade researching Rizal and then spent just one month writing a biography of um, 700 pages, which um, was then awarded the top prize in the Rizal Centennial Biography Competition. And the only regret he had at that time was that at 700 pages, it was just too long. And even though he read a book a day, he said that no normal human being can read 700 pages a day. Even physically, you get tired just holding up the bloody book. So um, <clears throat> I do recommend you to read it, though, if you do get the chance. You can probably get a Kindle version, though. It won't be so heavy. You don't have to read it all in a day. Um, But just understanding again what, what makes um, what made the national hero. And so this is the almost completing our journey through Philippine history, our, our lightning speed journey. This is um, from a speech given on the commemoration of Bataan. And that peace is justice, and justice is giving every man his due. Peace is the victory of life over death. And it is to victory, that victory of life that we survivors pledge ourselves. To those who lost it here in the Brotherhood of Courage, it will be the last victory, theirs and ours. For the true peace does not come with victory or defeat. It comes with justice, and justice is giving every man his due. And finally, um, this last one is, again, going back to that initial revolution against Spain, about what was going through people's minds, about what, what, um, why people weren't all eager to revolt against the Spanish. And we should not assume the great masses of people were on the left. Men do not always choose freedom. They often prefer security, tradition, and faith. When... Fernando VII left the constitutional path for the second time. The Madrid mob cheered him. Long live the absolute, absolutely king. Long live our chains. So men do not always choose freedom. They often prefer security, tradition, and faith. So these all form part of an exhibition which is history in 100 tweets. Um, as it's TED, it's 18 tweets. And um, if you want to see it, it's at the Ayala Museum. And the uh, address to follow is We Filipinos on, t on Twitter with the hashtag LMG100Tweets. Thank you very much. <laughs>